This is Torah portion Beshalach from the book of Shemot, the book of Exodus. It begins in uh, the uh, 13th chapter, beginning in verse 17. This Torah portion. A Torah portion, uh, for those of you who might be new to this concept, every week there's a Torah portion, there's a section of Torah that we read, a section from the prophets, and for those of us who believe in Yeshua HaMashiach, a section from the Brit HaDashah as well. Amen. And so in the course of a year, along with all of Judaism across the globe, we are reading through the first five books of the Bible, through most of the prophets, and then for our, our, in our case, reading through the Gospels and the Book of Acts. We do that in the course of a year. This Torah portion schedule was actually initiated by Nehemiah and the... Uh, Ezra, so it goes back that far, but it's interesting to know that we are literally on the same page with uh, Jewish brothers and sisters all across the world. It's kind of neat, isn't it? I love, uh, I've said this each week since we've been in Exodus, and I'll probably continue to say it until we get out of Exodus, and we, until we make an Exodus from Exodus. <laughs> and that is, I love, I love the story of the Exodus, and evidently so does Hashem, because every time we turn around, He's pointing us back to this story and saying remember 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 and the reason is because the book of Shemot and the story of Shemot is is really the story of our spiritual lives if not our actual lives and as Kevin has said a number of different times from the platform as we've been in this uh, in this book he has said that uh, we're supposed to be seeing ourselves as if we were actually there. And that's so true, because even at the Pesach Seder, we always remind everybody that this Pesach Seder is not about a historical event. And Judaism teaches, for instance, that everyone must see themselves as if they have been personally set free from Egypt. Yeah. It's not a history story. It's not, it's not a let's go back and review what happened. No, this is our forefathers, and we were as in, yet in their loins, so to speak. You say, well, I wasn't born Jewish. That's okay. There was a mixed multitude that came out from Egypt. We, there was Jamaicans. There were Spaniards and Frenchmen that came out. There was Germans, hallelujah. People from Lithuania, Puerto Rico, Colombia, Venezuela, they were all there. Every one of them, amen? That's why in Tennessee we have a place called Memphis, because somebody from Memphis was there. <laughs> Memphis is a city in Egypt, you know. It is, it was a city in Egypt. We've got the name, so somebody who used to live in Memphis came to Tennessee. <laughs> they tell you a little story about a name named Clive. Translates Jed. <laughs> I'm lying, don't believe that. <laughs> See, the, the Exodus is so incredible because it's. We often think about the story of the Exodus and, it, and we, we think about. That as I preached last week, he, Hashem is looking for the blood. We think about that instance as being the Exodus. That our forefathers put the blood on the doorpost and everybody got into the house and the angel of death passed over those who were inside the house. If you didn't hear the message last week, it's on, it's on the Facebook or what have you, and it's on YouTube. You can go, go listen to it, watch it. We often think about that being the Exodus, but that's not the Exodus. The Exodus is the entire story from the moment that we were captured in slavery to the very moment that we cross into the Holy Land. That whole event, that whole story is the Exodus. And so the Exodus continues today as we are look now coming to the part where our forefathers, we have been released from Egypt from the bonds of slavery. And, and, and let us remind ourselves how that happened. And again, we as Jews understand this. And often those who are from non-Jewish backgrounds confuse Torah observance with, with trying to earn salvation by works. And there's many people who believe that Jewish people, by and large as a whole, not to say that there aren't certain sections in Judaism that do this, and certainly that can be true for no matter who you are, but Judaism as a whole, many people believe that we're trying to earn our salvation by keeping the laws and so on. 
And that's not true at all because we recognize that when we were in Egypt, it wasn't laws, it wasn't army, it wasn't a protest. We didn't have an occupied Cairo that got us out of Egypt. We were there making bricks. And meanwhile, Hashem was making himself known to Pharaoh. And eventually it was Hashem that caused us to be released from Egypt. We did nothing except follow what he said to do. He said, believe and we, we believe. He said, slaughter the lamb and we slaughter the lamb. He said, put the blood on the doorpost, we put the blood on the doorpost. He said, move and we went. Amen. But it says in Exodus chapter 13, in verse 17, that it happened when Pharaoh sent out the people that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines. Because it was near, for God said, perhaps the people will reconsider when they see war, and they will return to Egypt. Hashem's pretty smart. He knows our weaknesses, right? And He's only going to put on us what we can actually handle. Right? And you might be going through a situation right now thinking, I can't handle this. Yes, you can. Otherwise, your father wouldn't be allowing you to walk through it. And so he looked at these people and said, these are slaves and they're not ready for battle yet because they haven't come to realize their potential and their power. Interestingly enough, later in the parasha, they do go to battle. But right now, not yet. He says in verse 18, so God turned the people toward the way of the wilderness to the Sea of Reeds. The children of Israel were armed when they went up out of Egypt. That's an important verse because I want you to focus in on the word armed. The children of Israel were armed when they went up out of Egypt. See, we often uh, remember, this is often talked about in various uh, commentaries, that, that we, we went and plundered the Egyptians all their gold and silver. And that's certainly true. Hashem said we would. So we, when He said, when you leave, just ask this, Egyptians for money. Don't you just think about that for a minute? How comical that scene might have been. Hashem has just taken Egypt through the ringer, and it's the God of the Jews who's done it. And so when this final major last plague happens, it's just terrifying and destructive. We're on our way out and we stop at an Egyptian's house and we go. Hi there, shalom. <laughs> Shalom, we're leaving and we're wondering can we have your stuff. <laughs> and you know the Egyptians were like, hey, take it, take it. Because we saw what your guy's been doing around here. What do you want? Oh, well, you know, all of it. <laughs> Silver, gold, precious stones. Everything you've stolen for us, you know. What the pommel worm, canker worm have taken, we want it back. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. But it says not just that they went up out of Egypt rich, but they went up armed. But here's the thing. The word armed, the root of it, is the same word as humash, which is five. And the apostle Shaul said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. See, there's five books of Torah. That's the central word of God. They went up, they went up out there, if I can spiritualize this, they went up out of Egypt with the word of God. Ready to pull down strongholds. You say, no, oh, it's physical armor. Yeah, it was physical. But how in the world can this band of slaves take, take and destroy the land of Canaan? They can do that by one way and one way only, the word of God. Amen. They want to, we went up out of Egypt with the word of God. Who is the Word of God? The Word of God is Yeshua, the Word made flesh, and it says they were led up out of the land by the angel of Elohim. Yes. Who's the angel of Elohim? He shows up in the Scripture all the time as the angel of Adonai, and that is none other than the pre-incarnate Yeshua. Yes. And so they went up armed. They went up from Egypt. Moses took the bones of Yosef with him, for he had firmly adjured the children of Israel saying, God will surely remember you and you shall bring up my bones from here with you. Joseph, don't even, don't even leave my bones in this place. Take my bones with you. Amen. They journeyed from Sukkot and encamped in Etham 
at the edge of the wilderness. Adonai went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them on the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day and night. I just want to point out something, just a little nuance. It wasn't a cloud and a pillar. It was Hashem. You notice that's what the text says in the Hebrew. It says Hashem went before them in a cloud at day, and Hashem was for them a pillar of fire at night. He so wants to be intimate with us in our daily lives, He doesn't send an angel to lead us. He Himself is right there with us. He Himself is leading us day in and day out. It's not just an angel. This is why it's a Pesach Seder. Seder. We say it wasn't an angel. It was Hashem. It wasn't an angel who delivered us. It wasn't an angel who led, uh, led us. It was Hashem and Hashem Himself. Talk about personal relationship. If you want to get in a personal relationship with Hashem, then you begin that relationship by putting trust and the, the atonement that we have through Yeshua and then begin to walk out His Torah. You want to talk about personal, right. intimate relationship. That's what it is. He did not remove the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night from before the people. And Hashem said to, to Moshe, beginning in chapter 14, Speak to the children of Israel and let them turn back and encamp before Pihah-Eroth, between Migdal and the sea, before Baal-Zathon. You shall encamp opposite by the sea. Pharaoh will say to the children of Israel, They are imprisoned in the land. The wilderness has locked them in. I shall strengthen the heart of Pharaoh, and he will pursue them. And I will be glorified through Pharaoh and his entire army. And Egypt will know that I am not alive. And so they did. This reminds me of something this week. I was thinking, really thinking about the poor, poor portion. It's had kind of a difficult week for me, to say the least. Just challenging week. And so I do... In order to kind of refresh, I do what all men do in challenging weeks. I watch a little bit of the battle scenes from Braveheart. <laughs> <laughs> and there's William Wallace. He's talking to part of his army. And he says, as soon as we attack, circle around the back. And he says, the one guy says, we can't, do, we can't separate our forces. <laughs> and William Wallace looks at him and says, do it. I let him see you do it. <laughs> and the guy says, don't think we're running away. I <laughs> That's exactly what God said, only not with that accent. <laughs> make them think you're stuck because I'm going to make myself known. And here's the deal. Amen. Amen. <laughs> they, they were still slaves. And here's the thing. They still had a slave mentality because their master was still alive. And even though the chains were no longer there, and even though they weren't physically in Egypt, mentally, they still had another master that they were connected to. And Hashem knew, I can't take these people where I need them to go. Ultimately, is to make, make me their master if they, if they still got their minds connected on, on, the, on the other guy. See, a man can't serve two masters. He's going to either love the one and hate the other, or love. The, you know what I'm saying? He's got. He's, he can't have two masters. And so he says, "I need to deal with this master." So go ahead and make, look at, make it look like you're confused. You wonder why in life you're doing stuff and you, you, you think you're in a confusion. And Shem says, "You're confused. I'm not. I, I'm doing exactly what I'm helping you to do." Hashem controls everything. He uses the devil like a pawn. Right. And He empowers us. Just, I think, this is not theological. I just think that Hashem empowers us just to give the devil a black eye. In other words, I'm going to empower these people that you've got, you think you've got your foot on with my rock so they can tell you to get lost. Yes. It's just another black eye to the enemy, right? I'm not saying that's a doctrine, don't. Go flying out of here. Send me an email. Amen. <laughs> it was told to the king of Egypt in verse 5 that the people had fled and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants became transformed 
regarding the people, I love that, transformed. His heart became transformed. Regarding the people, and they said, what is this that we have done that we have sent away Israel from serving us? He harnessed his chariot and attached his people with him. Attracted, rather, his people with him. He took 600 elite chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with officers on them. Adonai strengthened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Egypt, and the children of Israel were going out with an upraised arm. Egypt pursued them and overtook them and camped by the sea, and all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and army by Piharoth and before Baal Zephon, uh, Pharaoh approached the children of Israel and raised their eyes, and behold, Egypt, or excuse me, the children of Israel raised their eyes, and behold, Egypt was journeying after them, and they were very frightened. The children of Israel cried out to Adonai. And then Moses said, Were there, then they said to Moses, Were there no graves in Egypt that you took us out to die in the wilderness? What is this that you have done to us to take us out of Egypt? Is this not the statement that we made to you in Egypt, saying, Let us be, and we will serve Egypt? For it is better that we should serve Egypt than we should die in the wilderness. Amen. See, they, they were still connected in their minds to the slavery of Egypt. And they still feared, ultimately, what? Their master, which was the fact that their master could kill them. They feared death. Pharaoh represented death coming after them. And they were so concerned with this life that they were focused on fearing death. We fall into the same trap. We're, we're concerned with the master called money, or we're concerned with the master called our job, or we're current, concerned with the master called our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, our government, whatever it is, we're concerned with death itself, and so we're in slavery and in bondage to a master, and Hashem has to come through his son Yeshua and kill death and slay that master so that we can serve him. Amen. And I believe that some of us who even come to Yeshua have somehow maintained that old master in our life. It's called self. It's called what we want to do. And we're not willing to submit to his laws and enjoy absolute freedom. People don't understand the freedom that we have. You know, in, in, in talking about this situation, and, and I know I, I, I made it funny about the movie Braveheart, but there's some actually good scenes in that movie, good line. And he's talking to encourage the people to go into battle, and they said, we, 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 we might die, there's more of them than us. He says, yeah, you might die, but if you walk away from here, still a slavery to that man, are you really alive? Right. And when you go home, and years later, Will you say to yourself, what, what I might give to come back here and go into battle at least a free man? <laughs> See, we've got to face those things and say, yeah, you know, my friends may, may turn their back on me and I may, I may not be popular at work or I may not be popular among my family, but I'd rather be free in Hashem than shackled to what somebody else thinks yeah. or shackled to what my own soul wants. My soul, look, look, can I just tell you that our flesh is never satisfied? Our appetite is never satisfied. You know why people eat gross things? Because their flesh is not satisfied. You might leave your wife and go after some other woman because you think that she's better looking or whatever the stupid thing might be. You're going to get with her and guess what? She's going to leave you for some other dude and your eyes will be on some other girl. You're never satisfied. Never satisfied. That's why I tell people all the time, so I, I can worship God anytime. I, my, answer, my next question is, do you? No. no. <laughs> really? You're sad. It says here, Moses said to the people in verse 13, Do not fear. Stand fast. See the salvation of Hashem, 
that he will perform for you today. For as you have seen Egypt today, you shall not see them ever again. Amen. Adonai shall make war for you, and you shall remain silent. And Adonai said to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Now this is the part that really we need to pay attention to. <coughs> Speak to the children of Israel and let them journey forth. What? <coughs> Many of us have seen the incredibly historically accurate movie, The Ten Commandments, which are all to this <laughs> Watching that movie is like you were there. It's like a you are there moment. <coughs> and there's Charles, and he's got his hands up, and the water rolls back, and all the people are on the seashore marveling that the water is rolling back, and then when it's all rolled back, and the Things all dry, the seabed's all dry, then they start to walk forward into the water or into the dry seabed. That's actually not how it happened. It says in the scripture that first and foremost, the angel of Elohim, that's Yeshua, went to the rear of Israel and confounded the Egyptians with darkness. And if you want to believe it or not, according to ancient Jewish uh, oral tradition Pharaoh was so out of his mind that they were launching stones and giant arrows into the cloud and the cloud was just eating them up and the whole time they're just doing that and they're just seething to get forward but they can't move they're confounded. Meanwhile Hashem tells the children of Israel through Moses start walking forward Does he didn't part yet? The entire nation started walking towards the sea. And there's the sea. There's Slipper. There's the people walking towards the sea. There he, there he is. Some people say I look like him. I don't know. I don't really know. But here they're walking towards the sea. Water's still there. They get ankle deep, calf deep, knee deep. According to Jewish tradition, a prince of Judah named Nachshon comes barreling forth, kicking people out of the way in love, and runs into the water so that a prince of Judah would go forth first. And it says that he went into the water and he got neck deep and all of a sudden and Hashem was saying I'm checking your faith. I need to know will you just, will you just dive into the sea? Because I'll split it. Because it says journey forth. He says, lift up your staff. And he said, tell them to journey forth. In other words, tell them to get going. And you, in other words, meanwhile, you lift up your staff and stretch out your arm over the sea and split it. And the children of Israel shall come into the midst of the sea on dry land. See, you've got to come into the midst of the sea before you hit dry land. See, oh, let me say that again. Water's raging all around you. You're just going to walk out in faith. My God is my, my anchor. He is my support. He is my conqueror. He is the one who fights my battle. Water, water, supernatural dry land. See, that's how Hashem works. We've got to walk into the sea. He, some, some commentators, and I think this is important, some commentators believe because in the Song of the Sea, it says in all translations, including the Hebrew, that the water was congealed before them. It says in the Hebrew that the land was made dry, but it also seems to indicate that the water, there was a hardening of water. In other words, when they stepped out on the water, it supernaturally was like concrete. And I, maybe it, 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 it was because of the presence of Hashem who stood next to Moses when he lifted up his arms and the right hand of Moses represents the Torah 
or the right hand always represents the Torah. And so the right hand of Moses, Hashem was standing next to the right hand, and he was showing, this according to a Midrash on this, okay, that he was showing the sea. See, I'm, I'm validating the, the, the right hand here in the Torah. Why is that significant? What does all that mean? Because everywhere in Scripture it says, my right hand is going to save you. Who's the right hand? The right hand is Yeshua. Yeshua is the living Torah. And when Yeshua stood out on the lake, the Sea of Galilee, he looked out to the boat and he said, they said to him, Lord, is that you? Kepha said, if it's you, call to me and I shall come. And he said, come. And then as Kepha stepped out on hard water. Why was it hard? Because the living Torah was out there skipping around. By the way, it says that as soon as the living Torah, Yeshua HaMashiach, got into the boat on that, that event, they went immediately to the next, to the other side. You want to get where you want, you were trying to go spiritually the fastest, get Yeshua in your boat, get the Torah in your boat. I don't know, maybe we're going to fight against the waves. Trying to make this happen. Are you following the Word of God? No, I ain't for today. <laughs> You worship on the Sabbath? No. No. Get that porch up out of your mouth. I can eat whatever I want. <laughs> you celebrate the holiday? What holiday? Never heard of it. Yeah. Then Yeshua with the Torah comes to your mouth. Like, what in there? Whoa, whoa. Why was this so easy? Yeah. Yeah. Then we get suspicious because it's so easy. Uh. <laughs> Go to the internet. Try to find somebody to talk about it. <laughs> What are you doing, nothing? <laughs> Somebody sent me a message this week. They were not being serious. That's why I didn't respond. They were being cynical. They sent me a message asking what I thought about a particular topic. I didn't really respond to it because I, I perceived that they weren't open. I perceived they were just looking for a way out. I'm not a member of the show anyway. And I thought, I've got this big old website out there called MySarshalom.com. Yes. On that website is more than 400 hours, praise Hashem, of my personal sermons. There's an 87-page book that I wrote called The Holocaust. There's blogs. There's articles. There's all kinds of stuff. If you don't know what I believe, you know what I mean? I mean, that's... I was just wondering what you think. <laughs> you can go see it in HD. It's on the internet. <laughs> what I think. It says in verse 22 that they came upon the sea, or they came within the sea rather, on dry ground. It says, by the way, in verse 21, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and Hashem moved the sea with a strong east wind. That word wind in the Torah is ruach, which can mean wind, it can be translated breath, and it can also be translated spirit. This is how Hashem moves the waters for you. He does it by His Spirit. So what happened was is that Pharaoh in his, in his arrogance when this cloud that had been confounding him and, and buffeting him, when it removed itself, all of a sudden, Pharaoh had this bright idea, oh, good, now we can go. <laughs> you know, see, here's the problem. When, when you continue to defy Hashem, when you continue to reject His Word, when you continue to go your own way, He will turn you over to your own devices and you will be so blinded, there's no way you can see. This is why it's important for all of us as humans that we look at the Word and we just follow it. And try, stop trying to talk ourselves out of it. Hashem said, by the way, Deuteronomy 28, if, if, I, F, if, Spanish is C, for that, Spanish speakers? Yes, right. that's correct. Okay, thank you. Without the accent. Right. C with the accent. C, yes. right. Kid, okay. <laughs> and so, if you go and follow my commandments, then you'll be blessed coming in and blessed going out. 
It's this simple. If you come to my house and pick up the key, Hashem is saying in essence, the key to the lockbox, then when you have the key to the lockbox, you can go to the bank and withdraw a million bucks. Who is going to go to the bank and say, I want to go open the lockbox, and they say, where's the key? And you go, I don't have to have it. I demand it's a million dollars. You got to have the key. What's the key? The key is four. No. I deserve the million dollars. And he's going to love me whether I have the key or not. And Hashem says, I love you, man. With all my heart, I love you. Since I came down there and died for you. I love you so much. But I love you so much, I'm not going to let you be a brat. I love you so much that when I say do this and this will happen, I'm not going to allow you to do something else and allow that same thing to happen. Because that's not love. That's called bad parenting. <laughs> Clean your room or no ice cream? No. Okay. Here's some ice cream. <laughs> and then we wonder why fast forward 20 years, we're calling our friends for bail money to help get Johnny out of jail. It's all because you gave him ice cream when he shouldn't be in your hands. It's your fault. See? But see, here's the deal. This is what one commentator said. The Jews were saved from spiritual slavery. Slaves who were fleeing from their pursuing masters. But once Egypt was drowned in the sea, from that time on, they no longer had to fear Egypt. See, Yeshua said, or the apostle wrote rather, that the last enemy to be defeated is death. And so here's Egypt coming against Israel. And that was death that had to be swallowed up in victory. Amen. The water, by the way, in Torah, water always, always, always represents Torah. And I always want you to keep in connection between Yeshua is the living Torah and water always, always represents Torah. And so Yeshua was, or Hashem rather, was testing us and our forefathers to say, I'm wondering if you'll plunge into the Torah. Because it looks daunting, all those waves. It looks insurpassable. It looks too deep. It looks like, I can't do all this. But Yeshua just wants to know, are you willing to dive in? Because once you dive in, then I'll part the waters for you and it'll be easy. See, we learn this lesson from Chronicles 15, I believe it's 1 Chronicles, where King David is trying to bring up the ark to Jerusalem and he doesn't consult the Torah. Mm -hmm. He just puts it on an ox cart. A new ox cart with oxen who had never pulled a cart before. And David is up there and he's got the worship team playing. Chris is over there getting down. Everybody's dancing around. He's, he's having a great time and we just worshiping God with his whole heart. And then the ox stumble, the cart shifts, the ark starts to fall, and the Zai puts his hand out and like a like a, an Uzi hits his eye. Don't get it, Uzi. He dies. And King David is dumbfounded. What went wrong? We had love. We had worship. We had exhortation. We had magnification of his name. We had a new cart and new oxen. We had people dressed up. It was awesome. What was wrong? The Shem said, the, the part that was wrong is you did it your way and not my way. <laughs> and I told you in my Torah that the only people who can carry the ark are the Levites and priests. That's the only ones who can carry the ark. I don't know the ark's heavy. It's, it's, it's gold. It's wood-covered gold. But I, I, I said men carry it who are sanctified. That's what I said to do. So here's what happened, though. 
David got everybody together. And first of all, you got to love David because David is the man we all need a model. As a leader, he got everybody together and said, okay, what happened back then was my fault. Because I didn't consult the Torah. That's, that's on me. Okay? It, he didn't do like Saul did. But I was trying to please you. And, and, then, and, then, and you should have done it now. No, David, no, David said, no, you're right. It's, it's me. It's all me. My bad. So here it is. Everybody, get ready because we're going to do this just like the Torah says to do. There you go. Everybody get sanctified, get purified, get on some new clothes. Priest, I need like a thousand priests. The ark only takes like four guys. I need like a thousand priests. Okay. But here's what the scripture says. This is what I want to get to. They pick up the ark and the text says explicitly, go back and read the story later. It says that Hashem helped them carry the ark. See, when you do it his way, he helps you. This is why when the sea looks all daunting, and I don't know if I can do this Torah thing in Yeshua, and then you go, well, I'm going to do it because he's God. And you get in the water, you're like, oh, this is easy. Right. Why? Because he parted the water for you. <laughs> but if you just sit there and cry and say, I can't do it, it's too hard, he's going to get up. And guess what? You'll never be blessed coming in and blowing out. You say, well, before I heard you say that, Rabbi, Hashem has blessed me. That's right. The key is before you heard me say that. Because now you're responsible for what you know. That's right. And nobody comes to this place. Nobody listens to these videos online. Nobody hears it on wherever they're hearing it on, by accident. Right. Hashem is setting you up for a blessing. He wants you to hear the truth. He wants you to hear the word. He wants you to act on that word. But he sets you up for blessing. But we can choose door number one or door number two. Door number one is do what he says to do and be blessed and have a happy life. Door number two is something else. Right? Now I want to get to two more points here before I close. Because this tour portion is just too incredible. After this whole experience, the very next thing that happens to them, they sing a song of the sea. Let me just mention this, by the way. I don't even have time to teach on the song of the sea, but according to Jewish, ancient Jewish chronology, the seventh day of Pesach is the day that remembers the parting of the Red Sea. So that we must understand, according to Jewish understanding, the parting of the Red Sea, the day that this happened, according to Hashem's calendar, this is a Sabbath day. And on the Sabbath day, Miriam and her ladies and pick up timbrels and drums and begin to play musical instruments and sing songs along with the rest of Israel on the Sabbath. I just want to mention that. The Sabbath day. It says that they journeyed from there and they met, they came to a place that had bitter water. And this is the next thing that I want to I want to reveal to us this morning. They came to a place that had bitter water, and it says in verse 25 of the 15th chapter. They were saying to Moses, what shall we drink? And Moses cried out to Hashem, and Hashem showed him a tree. He threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. Now what did I tell you? I said every time you see water in, in the scripture, it always, always, always alludes to the Torah, to the Word of God. And the Word of God is bitter to, to, to the, until the tree of life gets passed into it. And then it becomes sweet to us. See, the Word of God, the, walk, the commandments of Torah may be bitter to us, but that, that may be because we're not connected to the tree of life, to Yeshua HaMashiach. In fact, you could also say that we ourselves, who are 70% water, made by Torah, because everything that has been made was made with Torah. Everything. That chair, this carpet, this bima, or that bima, this pulpit, us, we're all made with Torah, and we're 70% water. And Torah is bitter to us. In fact, we're bitter until the tree of life is cast into us. It makes us sweet. 
I was a bitter man until I met the Messiah. And when Messiah came in my life, man, I became sweet as sugar. That's my wife. <laughs> Moving on, group of shame. One final thing as we talk about this, I'm going to close with this. Last night at Sabbath, uh, Eric Shabbat's dinner, Zeke and Avi brought up a point that I, I didn't he have heard, had not heard before. And he was talking about in the 17th chapter when the, the children of Israel come and uh, they have to go to battle against Amalek. And Hashem, this is one of those things that in the Torah, Hashem tells us to remember six things, and one of the six things is the defeat of Amalek. Right. And Zechanavi said that it's an interesting fact that, and some of you may have heard this before, the, the term gematria, in, in Hebrew, every Hebrew word has a numeric value. And it's believed and has been believed for a long time that if one word has the same numeric value as another word, then they have a similar meaning. And so Zekinavi said to me, and the rest of the table, he said, did you realize that the word in Hebrew for doubt is the very same numeric value as it is for a medic? So that the very first battle that the Israelites fought, the very first time they drew their swords and went into battle, they were fighting doubt. And how did they win doubt? Did they win, did they win against doubt by their strategy or their expertise? No. It says that Moses stood up and he lifted up his hands. And as long as he was lifting up his hands and praying, the children of Israel were defeating doubt. But as soon as he stopped praying and his hands got tired, they began to lose the battle. So that Aaron, his brother, stood next to him. And also Joshua stood next to him. And they held up his hands. Now what does Aaron represent? He represents the Torah. He represents the Torah. Because he's the priest. He's the high priest holding up the hand. And Joshua's name in Hebrew is Yehoshua, which we say, the short version, Yeshua. So you have Yeshua on one hand, and you have the Torah on the other hand, and it's defeating doubt. You want to know how to overcome doubt in your life? You get into the Word of God. You get into the Torah of God. You don't just read it, but you do what James said. You live it out. And how you do that? You do it with, with Yeshua. So that on the one hand, you've got the Word of God. And you've got the living Word of God. Holding your hands up. And that's what defeats a medic. Amen. Amen.